Hello, today we're gonna to be talking about doing digital marketing research. Uh, and so let's start by talking about what is market research. Now, hopefully many of you have had a class in marketing research before, so I'm gonna kind of skim through a lot of the more detailed aspects here, but I kind of want to talk specifically about how to move marketing research from our traditional kind of uh, approaches, often using you know in-person surveys or focus groups and things like that, to modern day approaches using digital methods. Um, so what is market research? Well, market research is the systematic gathering, recording, and analyzing of data about our customers, competitors, and the market. A major aspect of digital marketing is that this has become cheaper and easier than ever to do before, right? Because of the fact that we can collect a lot of this data in the online context. And online market research is the process of using digital tools to collect that data, garner valuable insights about our brand, our customers, and our competitors, right? Now, there's a lot of benefits to digital research, right? People are always available online. The tools can be automated, right? We can write tools that just go out and collect data from what people are saying about our brand or our competitors on a regular basis. Um, you're not limited to your local neighborhood geographically, right? So you don't have to worry about just getting data about what people around you say. You can get data about people on the, on the other coast. You can get data about people in different countries, in different, uh, in, in different areas of the world that you might be looking at. Um, lots of resources, by the way, are already being spent collecting data online. You should take advantage of those resources, right? You should build upon that secondary research that's been done to try and improve the research of your own company, right? It's also interesting to me that consumers are surprisingly happy to share their thoughts on products. They don't like to be bothered necessarily in a context where, um, like, calling them up or things like that. But if you give them the opportunity to talk about your product online, they will usually do so, right? And partially, I think it's because of the asymmetric nature of the relationship, right? They don't have to do it when you want them to do it. They can do it whenever they have the time and the effort and the ability to do it. Um, digital research is also very cost effective and pretty quick to set up, which um, gets you going. Now, there's some tricks to it and you have to learn how to do it properly, but it is, it is, it is cost effective in the end. Um, you should also think about automating your market research as much as possible or automating the process of it so that it's carried out on a recurring basis, right? You need to be able to update your insights into your consumers regularly. People change, the market changes, you need to figure that out and think about how you're going to address those changes. You need to understand the dynamics of the industry. What are my competitors doing differently now that they weren't doing six months ago? Now, you might think you garner some of that insight by just kind of reading over the press releases, looking at that, but really, you know, looking to see how your consumers are talking about your competitors, or not necessarily even your consumers, maybe your competitors' consumers, is very useful in understanding the dynamics of the industry. You can also use recurring market research to identify new blue ocean products. And blue ocean, the idea is that this is an area that no one's really exploring yet, right? That some combination of product attributes, service attributes, whatever, that no one is really looking at. And it might be that if you do research right now, there's no demand for that particular combination. That's why no one's exploring it. But if you look, say, six months from now to a year from now, maybe that's changed. And so therefore, you can start to develop a new product. And you might also identify a new sales channel, right? Maybe there's new ways people are purchasing products that they weren't before. Online purchases, for instance, have gone up substantially in the last 10 years, and mobile purchases in particular have gone up quite a bit. That probably wasn't as big of a sales channel if you, you looked at it maybe three or even four years ago, right? Um, you can help to engage with new audience. Maybe there's a new audience that's become interested in your brand that you did not know about because it's happened over the last year or so. And hopefully you can co-create with your consumers, right? Trying to develop new products and new offerings that will really meet their needs. So how do you address the concept of marketing research? Well, there's five basic steps of marketing research that you should work uh, through. And these five steps help you to kind of systematize the process of market research. First, you need to establish the goals. What question are we going to answer? And this is vitally important. You don't, you, don't, you don't carry out market research in a vacuum. You carry it out with the goal of trying to answer a specific set of questions that you've set yourself. Then once you've identified what that goal is, now I can determine my sample. Who is going to be relevant to answering that question about that goal? We can then choose a data collection method from all the possible data collection methods we have, analyze the results, report out, and repeat the process again. Right? So how do we establish the goals? Well, you want to make sure you have a well-defined set of goals. You don't want to ask research questions just to ask research questions. 
You want to make sure that every question helps you to make a better decision. The litmus test should be, is there something differently I will do if I know the answer to this question? If the answer to that is no, then it's probably not worth of carrying out, right? If the answer is yes, then it probably is worth carrying out and we need to figure out what exactly that goal is. It's also important to keep the number of goals that you're going to conduct within any particular research, a research um, strategy small, right? If you have too many goals, that can confuse the answers to your questions, right? Because you're answering many, many questions simultaneously. But it can also confuse your consumers, right? If you're trying to figure out, for instance, what product I should market, what channel I should market through, what price point I should market through, all at the same point, your, your consumers are gonna have a hard time answering the questions related to that. Now, there may be ways to phrase that such that you could get access to some of those knowledge, but too many goals will cause confusion in the end. Um, in the end, you need to justify the costs, right? And so you need to think about, will the improvement or the change that I can make as a result of answering this question be worth the money I'm going to spend on answering the question? If the answer is yes, in, in, in an optimistic scenario, then you should carry out the, the research objective. If it's not, then you need to question it and think about it and maybe answer a different question instead. Once we've established our goals, now we can establish our sample. The sample needs to be representative of the group, right, that is described in your goals. And depending upon the firm, not all of your target market will be represented online in a substantial enough way to be useful. And you need to consider that. Right? You need to think about whether or not we need to do offline research in order to carry out our digital marketing campaign. Now, this could be because of the fact that they consume digital media, but they do not participate in the digital media space. Right? And so as a result of that, you need to carefully consider how you're going to carry out your strategy in order to look at what's going on. Online samples, and all samples for that matter, are notoriously biased, right? depending upon the method you work. But sometimes that bias can actually work on your favor. For example, let's imagine you're offering a new streaming audio service. It might be fine to use online, online data to kind of help answer some of your questions because of the fact that the population online participating in different platforms often seems to be the same kind of the pop target market that's going to be interested in a new streaming audio service. On the other hand, if you're trying to market something like a new television phone for uh, senior citizens, at least right now, you might have trouble conducting a lot of the research around that through an online sample. At this point, it's probably worth mentioning that there's a lot of different biases that can undertake within marketing research. Right? The research method itself may lead the respondents. This is possible to do uh, with a person interview or with a survey. Imagine you have some thoughts about what the answers to your questions should be ahead of time. You can write your questions in such a way as to lead the consumer to the answer that you want. This is sometimes referred to as confirmation bias. Um, it's something that you undertake in order to try and see the results you actually want to see, right? And we need to avoid this. And there's no clear-cut way to avoid this except for the fact that trying to keep into a mind to keep the questions as open-ended and as non-judgmental uh, about potential solutions as possible. Um, the very way you design the research could bias the results. There are also two main types of error that often come into marketing research. One is respondent error, and this is when the case when we present a device to take a survey or take a poll or take whatever to a group and we design it in a confusing way such that they don't know how to answer it to really give their proper responses. An example I often like to use for this is the quote unquote butterfly ballot that was used in the Florida elections in 2000, right? In that particular case, if you look at the, at the ballot, right? Um, the way it was set up was that half the, and half the people to vote for for president were on the left and half were on the right, but the answers kind of, the, the, the button you had to push kind of alternated between the two of them. And so you saw a lot of people who thought they were voting for Al Gore because they selected the second to pull it down or the second punch down, when in fact they wound up voting for Pat Buchanan instead because he's, the sec he's actually the second bullet down, he's just on the opposite page, right? Um, so this is an example of, would be classified as respondent error, but a lot of times respondent error is actually the result of the researcher developing a confusing question. 
You can another type of error that we see in the respondent error category is recall recall bias, right? So, do you if I ask you, do you recall how you felt six weeks ago just before you bought the product, right? You're going to be so distant at that point from the actual experience of the event that you're going to create a new memory as to what you felt that may or may not align with actually how you felt. And that's going to change your opinion as to what results you present. So one of the solutions to that is often querying your, um, your this, the querying, conducting your research immediately after something like a purchase event or something. Now, another type of error that you get, and this is when we talk about creating the sample correctly, is you get sample error, right? And so a classic example of, like, of this is in 1936, uh, in the presidential election, the Literary Digest predicted that uh, Landon would win the presidential election in a landslide. Um, in effect, Roosevelt won in a landslide, receiving 60% of the vote. So why were they so bad in their prediction? Well, they conducted their poll via telephone and telephones in 1936 were fairly rare and were primarily used by uh, more well-off individuals, right? So they were essentially sampling a rich population when in fact everyone got to vote no matter what. As a result, they got a biased sample. Of course, this brings up the inevitable question about whether 2016 was another example of a biased sample in terms of a lot of the polling that went on done on went on out there. And to some extent, it might have been one of the few polls that accurately predicted the 2016 election to many extent, to much extent, was the two th was the USC LA Times election poll, right? And one of the nice things about that, there were many reasons why this was a good polling method, right? A good market research method, if you will. But one of the arguments as to why it was um, a useful method was because of the fact that it conducted its poll anonymously online, getting samples from a large population of individuals, right? This might not have been a sample error problem, right, compared to the other errors, but a lot of the other polling methods out there actually still use random digit dialing in order to conduct their polls. Random digit dialing is when someone simply just enters a bunch of random numbers into a phone and polls whoever's on the other end of it, right? There's a huge bias there right now because of the fact that a lot of people use cell phones, which have probably, which are easier to screen out uh, spam callers from, and a lot of people simply don't want to take um, calls on their cell phone that are from strangers or other people, as opposed to participating in an internet online poll where they were tracking the same people over time who had agreed to participate in the poll, right? And so to some extent, the other methods, the other methods of polling besides the USC LA poll may have exhibited a sample error bias when we talk about our problems with predicting the 2016 election. Uh, and to feed that number, just look at this Pew report, which talks about how the growth in the cell only population is going up quite a very dramatically. If you go back um, 10 years ago, it was only about 10% of, of, the, of the population. Now, for many of the different uh, ethnographic groups, it's up to 50 to 60% of the overall population. And this includes even um, uh, when you look at all adults, right? And now if you look at some subpopulations like 18 to 29, we're talking 60 to 70%. So using random digit dialing, which has all these biases in terms of who's likely to respond on the other end, can cause problems in the surveys, resulting in um, a sample error, essentially, to your survey. So um, with that, let's stop for a second, and when I come back, we'll talk a little bit more about how to choose your data collection method and other aspects.